I will do some gymnastics so that you will all wake up because I know it's been long, two days. So let me start with explaining this slide. And I, I changed the title. I always change titles. I thought we are moving. Mobile margins on the move. The right to communicate. It's an interesting uh, reference to MDG's development and all kind of ideas that MTN, who is the provider advertising here, has in its mind when they make these adverts and when they speak to development. And I think that's something we did not raise at all. And it's not a topic of my presentation, but it's very important that we keep in mind that providers of mobile phones, of internet, etc., play, so to say, with the development message. They have also corporate responsibility and they spend money on it. And it's an interesting topic to go into, not for now, but when I rethought my talk yesterday evening, I thought, well, this slide, which I put there, especially because I like the slide, it also contains a message that links ICTs to mobility, to uh, uh, development in a way. Well, my paper, in fact, to be honest, it was a paper I had already written. Uh, I just changed it slightly. It's quite theoretical or reflective. And I will not go into all that in that paper. If you are interested in communication ecology, uh, mobility and marginality, read it. What I will try to do is give a glimpse. The, the paper was, in fact, also written as a starting point of a research project that we are now really trying to uh, work on. And this research project, um, yeah, it started a year ago, in fact, with active participation of PhDs, masters in different countries in Africa. So what I will do is give a glimpse of what we are doing there, and that relates directly to the paper that I gave you for reading, whoever likes to read it. Um, the start of the program was in April 2008. Students went into the field in September and then they had some teaching. So you can imagine we are a year ahead now in doing field work. The first results are coming out. Um, this project is on the combination of marginality, mobility, ICTs, mobile phones, communication technology in general. Marginality, of course, refers to one of the central topics of this, uh, these two days, which is the deprived. In a way, it's uh, another way of dealing with issues of poverty and remoteness, uh, exclusion, inclusion. But I would like to warn at the same time for this use of deprivation poverty. And that's where we walk into directly, immediately, when we talk about marginality. It's relative. People who we consider marginal need not feel marginal. And I just want to say so because it's, uh, uh, it's a positioning to others. So being deprived or redefining others as deprived means that we define them as such. It doesn't mean that they feel as such. It doesn't mean that their history is as such. Marginalities change over time. So I want just to give that as a, an idea behind also this story, because our project mainly relates to uh, a qualitative method. Yesterday, Inge Brinkman presented the case of Angola. That's one of the cases that we do. And she already uh, introduced that qualitative method, which is mainly life histories. OK, what I will try to do, these were just remarks for thinking, maybe they come up, maybe not, in the talk further. So that was marginality, then mobility. We work with mobile margins. We work in mobile margins, margins on the move. We try to uh, work in areas that are defined as marginal by outsiders, but the marginality is also appropriated by the insiders, the people who live there. For instance, in Cameroon, and I will talk about Cameroon mainly now, um, there is, we work in Anglophone Cameroon. It's not a marginal region in the sense of very poor, but it is poor. It's marginal in the sense of economically marginal, marginalized within the state, because it's Anglophone, the Francophones are in power. 
but it's especially marginal in the form of people themselves see them, define themselves as marginal. And they are marginal in the states, they are marginal in Cameroon, they are marginal in Douala, they are marginal in Bamenda, and they are politically marginalized. That's how they define themselves. And that's something I will come back to because it's interesting to see how these margins then, defined by people themselves and by outsiders as well, sort of become strings of margins, mobile margins, so to say. And in these mobile margins, ICTs play an important role and may change these margins in a way. So that's to indicate a little bit of our study. What we also do is we consider these margins not as isolated. Margins and people are always living in context, history, social, economy. And a term that's depicted for that, not by me, other scholars like Miller and well, many others, is uh, the communication ecology. And I think communication ecology as well is something that's an interesting term that helps us to describe our cases in context, in history. And it's important because without that context in history, we cannot understand why people do what they do. So it means that research becomes increasingly complex. Qualitative, so you're interested, we are interested in people who live in these margins, in their history, in their context, etc. But how do they do that? And how do you then do research? That's a methodological question that I will not really go into. This is a, a picture that reminds me of the whole debate on appropriation. Of course, in our study, we look especially in how the, not only mobile phone, but how communication technologies are appropriated in these mobile margins huh, and how then people in these margins redefine themselves because of the appropriation of these. There's many aspects of that and I will not go into everything, but one aspect is that people make the phone something of themselves, of course, and they make it mobile and they feel mobile with it. It's just a very nice picture. This picture could keep me talking for a year, I think, because there's so much to be seen in it. That's part of the study we do. We analyze pictures and we analyze symbols that we see in the towns. Well, just a very quick view of the mobile phone in these marginal, marginalized regions. We work in uh, central Chad to Jamena, northern Cameroon. That's one of the mobile margins. The other is uh, Anglophone Cameroon, which is the west of Cameroon towards the states. Another area is central Mali to southern Mali, which is a nomadic area, a nomadic migration. The other area is the area where Inge was talking about southern Angola, but with linkages to Zambia and South Africa. So those are the areas where we work. What is interesting, this is a coverage of mobile phone networks in 2005. You see that the areas where we work are in fact not connected or they are, they are partly connected, partly not connected. It's interesting also to consider that some of these areas, network is there, people have phones, other areas where their families may live or their friends or relatives. So the mobile margins stretch over areas where there's network and not network. Just interesting to consider. This is to show you how quick it is spreading and the areas where we work are increasingly covered. And what we do in this research is we just see it happening. In 2005, Central Chad got network. We were there. It's interesting to see what is happening. I was there, not yet the group. Now, increasingly, the empty spots are connected and we try to follow as well what is happening and how then they reconnect to others. So that's, uh, so it's, I like this sort of, you see how it changes. So then we go to uh, Bamenda. Just a very quick, uh, Bamenda is West Cameroon. It's a, an area that has a history of mobility. I will not go in all the details, but during colonial times, but also before colonial time, chieftains in these areas were mobile. They went from one area to the other. It had to do with ecology, economy, and conflict, especially. Colonial region, plantations in the coast, this was a labor reservoir, so people moved. And they, this moving became part of their lifestyle. Recently, you also have a, we had political conflicts, people move out. There's other conflicts, people even ask asylum because of political conflicts at the level of national politics. 
So there's many reasons that people move out of this area, but there's no family who has nobody living somewhere else. And I don't say it's all in the States, no, migration within Africa is very important and we have to consider even uh, the, the Cameroon, Nigeria linkages. These are all mobilities and displacements and multi-sidedness of this society that has been growing in the course of uh, the centuries with maybe a new phase since the 1990s when there was economic recession and people moved massively towards the states. And we are still figuring out why exactly, but it has something to do with internet and mobile phones. And um, the area where the, the picture, the previous picture is uh, Bamenda, which is the main town in that area where we work. It's a huge town, but it's a self-made town. The state is hardly investing in this area. There are roads, but not that many. There are, nowadays there's network, um, but that's only since 10 years in towns. The rural areas further are just connected one year ago, two years ago, it depends on where you are. So it's a sort of a scattered history of getting connected. And this getting connected in rural areas delivers, this is the palace of the font, the palace is about 200 years old, and this television, masts and all the electricity was there since two years. Okay, so what happened when these telephones came there, when people became connected in a different way? So and now I go to the heart of what we do research on. We say, okay, the phone comes in, what happens? The first thing that happened is the establishment of the companies itself. They come with a a whole new image of what people can become. And we were talking about images of mobility, of migration. I think companies come with it, a modern, sort of modern uh, idea. I mean, when you enter this office, which was opened in 2008, an MTN office, it's clean, it's empty, it has IKEA uh, furniture in it. So people walk in and they see another world, a world that speaks to them that reinforces other, other images, that also changes your position in the margins, changes your feeling of being part of a connections. A new connection was introduced. Connection not only, not only in that sense, but also another connection, an economic connection, because it brought with it a whole new niche for the economy. So you see new strings of economy are sort of appearing, linking the margins to South Africa, for instance. Well, it's, it's, these are ideas, I still have to work them out, but it's interesting. But you also see within the region, you have the head office in Bamenda, another head office in Douala, and these, for instance, the selling of cards, the selling of airtime, is organized from that super office to smaller offices, to smaller offices, to the street vendors. And it's a hierarchical system of selling. So when we talk about, okay, what does this economy bring? It brings a connection between spaces in colors, because MTN turns the towns and the rural areas into yellow. It turns, it changes language. So there's becoming a sort of a, a new yeah, linkage, new family ties, one could say, the family of MTN, and people feel they belong to it. And it, but at the same time, it introduces new hierarchies. So when we talk about development, that's something to consider. What is really happening there? And how do people perceive these new economic ties? These call boxes have a whole system of hierarchy behind them. Because it's MTN who gives airtime out, but then it leaves it in the hand of the people to organize selling of it. This man comes from the rural area just for a few months in Bamenda, the box is owned by his brother, who lives in Douala, who has some money to buy this box. He has to pay his brother quite a lot of money. And finally, at the end of the day, he has a little bit of money, depending on MTN, his brother and his family is suffering in a small room somewhere in the periphery of the town. And then after rainy season, or before, <laughs> just after the dry season, they go back and work the land, and come back again in the hope he finds his call box. Well, this kind of dependencies, I can talk endlessly about it because there are many sorts of it, but it introduces new dependencies on different levels. 
that's one element of the study I wanted to show you. The other is life histories, family histories, and what do they learn us? That's in fact also a methodological question, of course. We, did, we do also family histories of coal box <coughs> owners, by the way. But let me now go to this woman. It's Madia, she's a good friend of me. She's uh, Fulani. Fulani are cattle herders uh, all over West Africa with a specific, situ specific position in the ethnic landscape. Yeah, it's fine. So she is um, uh, part of that cattle keeping people, but she's no longer a nomad. She moved to the town. Her family though still lives in the rural areas and uh, keep her cattle there. 20 years ago, sh she was married to a man who lived in Nigeria. So she went to Nigeria. She came back from Nigeria after riots there. It was just too violent, she could not stay. So she came back to Bamenda. Did not join her family back in the village, came to Bamenda. Still has her family ties in Nigeria, family cattle area. Her sisters moved on to Yaoundé, Douala, other places. So you see a whole network of family relations. That is one of her networks. The other is, well network, I don't know, even know if that's the right word to indicate this, but the other is she brought from Nigeria this sewing machine. The sewing machine allowed her to make a living for herself, independent from her husband. So she's really an independent woman with an income now. With this sewing machine, she needs cloth, but cloth for Fulani, you cannot buy it in Bamenda. So you have to go to the north of Cameroon to buy it, because that's where there's the basic uh, settlement of Fulani, so to say. She buys her cloth there, traveled up and down every, one, every month, she told me, and bought her cloth, came back. Had a whole, she has a whole string, again, in Yaoundé she has relatives who sell cloth, so she has another network of what, which we could label her economic network. And then she has a network of the people with, for whom she makes these clothes, which are all Fulani women in that area. Okay, that was the situation before the phone already. So she has a, she's a central woman in a big network. Then the phone came in and Maria adopted a new identity. She became a phone woman. And why do I say that? It's really, it has become her identity, but it has become her tool, it has become her everything. She walks around with her handbag with this white phone in it, and every time I travel with her, because we travel a lot to see all these people, she opens it and always calls. And that's only since, she, she told me she bought the phone in 2006. In January 2006, I started to follow her. That was the moment she bought that phone. She tells me that, okay, now I can just order the cloth. I send money with Express Union. I can call my people in Yaoundé. And my customers call me when they want something. I have their measure, so it's no problem. I can easily make these things for them. And they come and pick it up. Or I send it through transport. You see what a difference this is. First she had to travel a lot. Okay, this case of Maria is maybe a bit specific, but it's telling. It's telling us what can happen. What she also did, because she has money, the moment her cattle herder was linked to the network on the top of a mountain, he could call, because it's not that frequent in that area yet, she bought him a phone. So he calls her from now and then to inform her about the cattle. Her mother in the village, a woman of, she's now 65, I think, or a bit older, she didn't know how to handle the phone, didn't know about phones. When network arrived in that village, Maria bought her a phone so that she can call her mother and doesn't need to go down to the village that often anymore. But what, what Maria also does with the phone, she calls her friends, her, her sisters in Douala, Yaoundé, her sister in Ethiopia. So it's interesting to see, I will show you a picture of her mother, that she is sort of tying the family ties, but also the ethnic ties. And that's something I want to stress, yes. No, I'm not going to stop, I will finish this. Because here you see herself on top, the, she's standing, the mother stands in front of her brother who is in the USA, and that's the last string of these people. They are Cameroonians in the USA as well, 
And Maria with the mobile phone, finally she linked up to that <coughs> man, her uncle. And when I went to the States, I found out that he lives there in a world of Cameroonians with Cameroonian shop, Cameroonian drinks, and it's all there. And they call now regularly, and she even forced him to come over. It's just an example of how these things and uh, the ties work nowadays. So what, is, what can we conclude of this one story? And we have many more. We have them from all these areas that I told you. This is our world map. What is happening to this world map? I think we can, in due time, really trace different borders. We are no longer talking about nationalities. We may talk about strengthening of ethnic ties, strengthening of all kinds of groups that are put, they, are, they live together in these mobile margins. So you get lines from the States to Africa in, as a sort of a border. You get lines from central Chad to northern Cameroon as a new border. And that's just an idea. I hope you can imagine a new world linked through connection and excluding people from these connections in different ways than we do nowadays. And this is just to let you know that in due time, we will all have a phone and that's why we exist. And um, this is my address and the web mail address from where you can find information of our research project. Okay.